as a people, as a group, as a community of faith. We gather in, in this, this place, place to listen, to, to speak, speak, to worship, to, to pray, pray, to be with God. Because, because we, we know, know it, it is, is with God's, God's authority, it is, it is with God's, God's love that, that we live. live. Alleluia. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, Oneonta. Today's scripture reading comes from Exodus chapter 34. I'm going to start with verse 4. Here now, this is God's word. So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first, and he rose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai, as the Lord had commanded him, and took in his hand two tablets of stone. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for how we learn more about your character and who you are. And as we learn more about you, Lord, may we learn to trust you more and more on this great journey of faith. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there's a popular saying that's often used. It goes like this. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Well, the moral of this teaching is that it's unwise or even foolish to completely trust somebody who's already burned you in the past. And from a human perspective, you know, this teaching makes a lot of sense. If your spouse or your business partner or your friend betrays you, well, it makes sense that if you do want to keep the relationship, you would only keep it only so close. You would always forgive them, but only in part. And, the, and what this means is that you would draw them closer to you, but um, you would still keep them at, at some type of arm's length. Uh, just a bit. Why? Well, to protect yourself. Because how do you know they're not going to do it to you again, right? You know, forgiving, but don't completely forget the situation. That's a, that's a human perspective. That's a worldly perspective that we have today. And hey, you know, some people might even like to have a situation where somebody wrongs them because it allows them to have what's called a victim status. It means at any point they can bring back what that person's done to you and be able to lord it over you and to use it to try and win an argument. Um, so half forgiveness can be a serious problem. And the truth of that is, is it's really not real forgiveness at all. And we can experience this dynamic, well, too often in human relationships. And sometimes when we experience this in the people around us, we try to project this trait onto God too. But the Bible shows us repeatedly that God does not forgive his children this way. He completely forgives them. He completely restores them. He does not hold us at arm's length. And as we wrap up our road trip series today of looking into the book of Exodus and how God had brought the Israelites through the desert, we learn that we can really truly trust God uh, because he really truly forgives us all the way. Um, and so let's see how God first established a, a covenant relationship with his people. If we look back to Exodus chapter 19, we studied uh, in that verse, in verse 5, it says, If you will obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my own possession among all nations. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests 
and a holy nation. This was the essence of the foundation of God's promise to the people, that he would make them holy. He would set them apart from all the nations of the world, and that through Israel, God would show and reveal himself as uh, who he is, a God who's filled with love and compassion and grace. And that's a very special thing. Um, and so how did he do this? Well, he signed this covenant in his word, and we saw that he did this. He, he uh, gave, them, gave Moses uh, two tablets of stone, and on the tablets were the Ten Commandments, written by the finger of God. The covenant was then sealed by the shedding of blood of uh, sacrificial animals. Obviously, this, uh, both God and Israel accepted this uh, as a, uh, the consequence they would associate with breaking that covenant. And we saw the covenant was delivered. How? Through the presence of God. And Israel worshipped. And there was this beautiful communion between God and his people right there on the mountain. Um, and so, as they know, as they're about to venture into the promised land, that God's saying, I'm going to be with you in the promised land, and I am going to be the one that you trust while you're living there. But last week, we studied how Israel broke this covenant, and they didn't just break it halfway. They broke it as hard as they could. So that 40 days, Moses was on the mountain. When he came down, Israel had totally forsaken the Lord, forsaken the promise they had made with them. They were worshiping an idol, a golden calf. Uh, they were living in debauchery and drunkenness and celebrating this, this sinful new uh, lifestyle. And God saw it all. He was very, very angry. And we saw last week that we can still trust God when he's angry. Now, Moses responded in anger as well. Uh, in the previous chapter, what we studied today, it says that Moses came down from the mountain and he smashed the Ten Commandments. Because in this moment, he saw that Israel had broken it. So by smashing the Ten Commandments, he's basically saying that it, it's worthless now. It doesn't mean anything. He disciplined those who were stubborn. Uh, and we also see that he gr took the golden calf, he ground it down to dust, he threw it in the waters for the people to drink. Uh, you know, there are real consequences to breaking a promise with God. And it really reveals that the human heart Often when God is reaching out to connect um, in his holiness, the human heart is to run towards sin and to be, as the Israelites were called, stiff-necked and stubborn people. But as the dust sort of settled after the initial response to Israel's uh, betrayal to God's covenant, a really remarkable thing happens. God himself graciously comes around and he begins the process of completely restoring Israel as his people once again. And we know that this was initiated in part through an intercessory prayer of Moses. Moses himself was the one who said, God, don't destroy your people. Remember your promise. Remember how the people, uh, the nations will see you. Remember that you made a promise to their ancestors. Um, and so there's all these things in play, right, happening. And now God is ready to recommit himself to his people. Let's see how he does it. The first thing is he restores the sign of the covenant. What was the sign? The tablets, the tablets of stone. We see that in Exodus 34, 4. So it says, so Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first. And he rose early in the morning. He went up on Mount Sinai as the Lord commanded him. And he took in his hand those two tablets of stone. God cut the first two tablets uh, and wrote with his finger on them. This time, because Moses smashed the first set of tablets, he invites Moses to bring two tablets. And God writes on those as well the same Ten Commandments. So in this moment, that stone, the stone in which it was written on, you know, stone is tough. It's something that lasts. And it's supposed to represent the permanence of God's promise to them. But it must have been very unsettling when the first tablets were smashed. Can you imagine being an Israelite to see the crumbles and the remnants uh, of that sign? Well, the beauty of it is God gives them uh, that sign again in tablets of stone. But this time, the weight of the sign, the, the substance of what makes it last, you realize it's not in the stone in which it's carved. It's actually the character of God and the word of God itself that makes it real and makes it last. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 35, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words will never pass away. And so those new stone tablets were just a reminder, a sign that were pointing to the real substance of what made it stick, which was that it was spoken by God himself. And because it's God's word, we know it'll last forever. I guess the question for us today is when God speaks to us in his word, in the Bible, do we receive it as truth? And do we know and, and trust that it will last even when hard times come in our lives? That is difficult when we try to do it on our own. But when we look to God and his character, we realize 
It is God that makes his word stick. And that's where we take our, our hope in. The second thing is, uh, after restoring the sign of the covenant and the tablets, God restores the delivery of the covenant. How? Well, he brings his very presence upon the people. Exodus 34, verse 5, it says, The Lord descended in the cloud, and he stood with him there. Now, I don't even know what that means, that God would stand. God doesn't even have legs in the way that we have legs. But there is something happening here. In the previous chapter, in Exodus 33, we saw Moses ask the Lord to, to allow him to see his glory. And God showed Moses what Moses could handle, which was that he hid him in the cleft of a rock, he passed over him, and he allowed to see God's backside or his afterglow, if you will. But now God's showing up, he's passing over him, and he's, he's standing with him there. Now this refers to what I believe to be the Shekinah glory of God, which is something that we've seen how God consistently is showing himself to his people on earth in the form of a cloud, a light, uh, some type of form that shows the substance that he's there with them in some sort of physical way, which is really quite profound. And we see it many times. We saw it on Mount Sinai. We saw it in it, when he went through with the Israelites through the through uh, on their Exodus uh, event out of Egypt, through a cloud by day, a fire at night. We saw uh, how the cloud of God, the Shekinah glory, came down to Moses in Exodus 33 when he was at the tent of meeting. And we will see, if you keep reading the Bible, how the cloud shows up in Solomon's temple with glory, how we see how when Mary conceived Jesus, uh, the Holy Spirit fell upon her uh, in the presence of God in that same glory. And it was on Jesus in the transfiguration on the, on the mount, and it will return with Jesus when he comes again in his second coming in Revelation 1.7. So God's presence, man, he, he wants to be with us and he is with us. And this is a great evidence that he is a forgiving and loving God. He's not keeping us at arm's length. He's drawing us closer and closer and closer. And this is a part of what real forgiveness looks like for us. And when God forgives his people, it, there's this word grace that's involved. Grace, it, literally translated, could mean a stooping down or a condescending of God. Now, when we think of that term condescending between humans, well, it's kind of offensive because one person and another person, they're the same, right? But God is higher. He is holy. And it's important for us to understand that we are in sin and we are lower. And we are created, which means we are lower. This idea that God who is holy, who is perfect, who is uncreated, would come down to be with us is an awesome and miraculous thing. And this is really a gift. And this is really God's grace. And doesn't this just point us to the work and ministry of Jesus Christ? I mean, doesn't everything we see in Exodus so far show us that the grace of God is manifest to us in Jesus himself? In Christ, we can touch him. We can touch God. We can see God. We can hear God's voice. He is a living embodiment of God's grace to us because he's with us. The third thing we see is that God restored their trust in the covenant as well. God's character is the basis upon which we can trust God's word. And this is what God proclaims uh, about himself in Exodus 34, verse 6. It says, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed. And the first thing he says is, the Lord, the Lord. Anytime you see repetition in the Bible, you know it's important. But it also can represent, can also represent the permanence of God's name. That name, Lord, if you see it in all caps in your Bible, it's usually a translation for the word uh, Yahweh which we get the, the Hebrew tetragrammaton, which is uh, that those four, so, uh, those four letters, Y, H, W, H. It means I am that I am. Okay, that name is, is a reflection of God's eternal nature. He has been, he is, he always will be. And so when God proclaims Yahweh, Yahweh, his name twice, he's, he's showing that he is the unchanging God. He is the one who has been, is, and always will be. And friends, that is a huge encouragement to us in a world where relationships are constantly in a state of flux. God's character is consistent. He stays the same. People can change. Circumstances can change. Things happen. Tragedies, horrors, disappointments and shame. And these can shape us and shape the people around us to change our minds about one another. But God never changes his mind about what he does and who he is uh, in the sense that he's, 
he's influenced by um, by the events of the world or even our own actions. God is truly has a plan that that supersedes all things, and really, it's it, there's something about God's consistency that is so amazing, and it's reassuring. Verse six says, so it says, the Lord, the Lord. A God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Wow, that's a lot. That's a lot said in just that little, uh, that one sentence there. We talked about God's slowness to anger last week. I won't unpack that again. Go back and check it out if you want to hear it. I want to talk a little bit about the rest. God describes his love as something that is steadfast which means it stands strong no matter what the circumstances are. It endures. He says he stays faithful to us, and that means even when we aren't always faithful to him. So his faithfulness is more contingent upon who he is and his nature, and it's less upon our obedience. That's important because, well, if you're a human being like me, you make mistakes. Knowing that God still loves me is a huge comfort to me. Um, It also says that God describes his love as something that abounds, something that overflows. It's abundant. It doesn't run out. You know, there are, uh, I've heard one theologian say that there are infinite storehouses in heaven filled to the ceiling with God's love. And that he's just waiting for opportunities to spill it over and to pour it out upon his children. You know, if, I, I think that we, it's good for us to bask in the awesomeness and the, the plenteousness of God's love um, because our love can run out, but his ne- love never does. And it also says that he forgives. And look at what he forgives. There's three things mentioned. He forgives iniquity. Iniquity means to basically to twist or pervert or to ruin something, to poison the well. He forgives transgression, which means to cross over a boundary or, or a law or a standard that you shouldn't cross. It says it crosses over uh, that he forgives sin, which means to miss the mark or to fall short. Doesn't that just cover every mistake we've ever made in our life? It, these three things are really the substance of what all sin is encompassed. And God says, I forgive it all. There is no sin out there that I cannot overcome with my grace. And that is absolutely amazing to us. But his forgiveness comes with a condition. Look in verse 7. It says, But God will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And some of you in this moment might be thinking, Aha, there it is. (laughs) That's what I was waiting for. The other side of the coin. Uh, How can a loving and gracious God be both judge of the guilty, and even visiting that guilt upon their children. Wait, how, how can God be both? John Piper wrote a really great article that helped me understand this better in uh, DesiringGod.org, and I'm going to read a little excerpt from it. He points out in the prophet Joel, chapter 2, verse 12 through 13, it says, God said to the rebellious people, Yet even now, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. And Joel goes on to encourage the people, return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and repents of evil. Doesn't that sound just like Exodus 34? It does because he's quoting it. In Exodus 34, 5, um, I'm sorry. It says, in other words, Joel uses this passage in Exodus 34, 6, to encourage the people that if they return to the Lord, he will turn away from evil that he is about to bring upon them. So the assumption is that the people whom the Lord will not forgive are unrepentant people who will not return to God with all their heart. Forgiveness is for the repentant. The refusal of forgiveness is for the unrepentant. And this is a really big distinction here. This is why Jesus came down in the first place, to save humanity from sin. But as Jesus has shed his blood, it is for those who receive that payment, that that price, for them to be able to receive all the benefits of it. Jesus doesn't force his grace upon us. God doesn't force his grace upon us. He's a perfect gentleman. And so there's an important thing about repentance, about turning away from evil. 
the second part of what we read in Exodus 34, 7, which is talking about God judging the children of sinners to the third and fourth generation, plays into this same application. It's referring only to the children of those fathers who walk in the sins, the children who walk in the sins of their fathers, not to the children who turn from the sins of their father and repent. And the prophet Ezekiel also confirms this in Ezekiel 18, 19, when he says, when the son has done what is lawful and right and has been careful to observe all my statutes, he shall surely live. So here we see God's mercy is given freely and completely to those who do embrace it. And in order to embrace it, friends, we have to humble ourselves and to turn away from sin, to seek his forgiveness, to walk that new path of obedience. Now, this is where you come to the tension part. But what if I mess up? And this is where true grace is found. That God sent Jesus down to pay that price for us, to walk the walk we couldn't walk, to observe and to keep God's law faithfully, and then to die and receive the wrath of God that we should have died and received. He did that upon the cross for us by shedding his own blood. And so we see it all wraps together. The grace of God is perfectly given to us in Jesus Christ. And that is where we find ourselves today basking before the awesomeness of God's forgiveness towards those who receive it in faith. The Apostle Paul was so stunned by this, he couldn't stop writing about it. There's so many passages in the New Testament. I'm going to read you one from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. He says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. See, God doesn't give a half-hearted forgiveness to those who come to him with all their hearts, who repent from their sin and to seek Jesus as their payment. I guess the question for us today is, have we been showing half forgiveness to the people who have hurt us? You know, if you're a Christian, we have to walk and be like Jesus Christ. That means we have to forgive in order to receive forgiveness. The Bible, Jesus said, if you don't forgive, your heavenly Father will not forgive you. Now that is a wake-up call for us who want to live our lives saying we're a Christian, but at the same time not living and extending that same forgiveness to those who have hurt us. If you've been harboring in your feelings, uh, feelings of bitterness, of resentment towards others, friends, Jesus commands us. You have to give those up to him. You have to turn it over to him and not carry that anymore because God is not doing that to you. He has completely washed you clean of your sins. And so it's, uh, it's imperative that we offer that same forgiveness to others in our own lives too. And you know what? When we get, turn to Jesus and say, Lord, I don't understand how to forgive this person, but you do. I want you to to take, to give me the forgiveness that you have for me and show me how to give that to this person too. And you know what? Jesus can do a miracle in your heart. He can bring healing where there was only poison and sin and death. He can turn around a relationship that was toxic and, and, and horrible, and he can turn it into something that is new because he did it with you and him first. He can do it with you and another person. Second thing is, if you're sitting here and you're listening to this message and you're thinking to yourself, I'm not really even sure if I am a Christian. I'm not sure if I've totally repented of my sin and really truly received uh, the gift of grace and salvation in Jesus today. Friends, it's very tempting for us to want to go halfway with our relationship with God. Many people do this. There's a, a famous poem written by Wilbur Reese. It's called Three Dollars Worth of God. It goes like this. I would like to buy three dollars worth of God, please. Not enough to explode my soul or disturb my sleep, but just enough to equal a cup of warm milk or a snooze in the sunshine. I don't want enough of God to make me love a person with different skin color than mine or to associate with the poor. 
I want ecstasy, not transformation. I want warmth of the womb, but not a new birth. I want a pound of the eternal in a paper sack. I would like to buy $3 worth of God, please. Friends, don't settle for halfway forgiveness from God. And don't think that we, in our repentance, can go halfway and say, I'm going to hold on to this sin because I need it. Friends, the grace of God is something that liberates us and transforms us. But we, but Jesus did not go halfway for us on the cross. He went all the way to death and back. And friends, for us, we have to learn that if we want to receive the forgiveness of God, we have got to let some things in our life die that don't please God anymore. We have to give that to Jesus and ask for him to shine his grace upon us and make us new. Let's do that now. Lord Jesus, I thank you for what is taught in your word today, that you are a God who is slow to anger, merciful, filled with compassion, steadfast love. Lord, I want all of that today. I need it, Lord. But I know that I have sin in my life. And so, Lord, right now I lay my sin before you. I cannot overcome it. But Lord Jesus, you've overcome it on the cross. And we receive right now the gift that you've given in your blood for us. And Lord, I pray now that you would make us new people, new men, new women, to walk in your footsteps and teach us, Lord, and show us how to share that grace with others today. We pray this in your holy and precious name. Amen. Great is your faithfulness, O God. You wrestle with the sinner's restless heart.
It's 